Welcome to the Open Mic Podcast Show with Mike Midgley. Hey, and welcome to the Open Mic Podcast. And on today's episode, I'm excited to be covering the essential topic of client acquisition. So, you know, today's influencer guest is Landon Porter, the head of Gorilla at Gorilla Marketing based out of Denver, Colorado. And if you think about this, you know, in my fifth grade level, not, not um, you know, not London's, but in my fifth grade level, if in any business without a structured, sustainable way of securing clients, then your business is, you know, pretty much going to go out of business. It's simple as, you know, and for you guys, you might be listening to the car, you might be watching it on the blog, doesn't really matter. You know, if you don't have this, you know, nut cracked, if that's the right word to put it, then ultimately you're either going to be struggling, you're going to be continually borrowing, you know, paying interest and ultimately losing, you know, um, share in the market, which could take you out of business. So it's an obvious one, client acquisition, state the obvious, you might say, Mike, but I'll tell you what the amount of people I see in boardrooms, the amount of people I see in business, you know, and you know, there's an act at the front, but they ain't got this nailed, and they're constantly hacking at it, getting it wrong, and ultimately, uh, we're hoping to get you on the right track here. London helps business owners attract clients by packing up everything you've been told about sales and throwing it out of the window. Forget it. London says there's no sales script, no selling your soul for a check, um, no more chasing yeses or going for the no. Simply that just doesn't work anymore. And to be fair, at the front end of my sales business and leading my sales team, I got to pretty agree with that. You know, it's pretty much spot on. Uh, so if you're currently in an environment that you're in an old fashioned way of doing things, you may want to hit me up using the hashtag the open mic and uh, I'll be happy to sort of answer any questions. But also if you, you can uh, contact uh, Landon and his team, just use the hashtag uh, the sales gorilla and uh, those guys are going to get that answered for you uh, from that side so um De- uh, Landon's joining us from all the way from denver in colorado today uh so how are you doing buddy good to welcome you to the open mic show i am fantastic mike thank you for having me on the show i'm uh i've been thinking about this since i got the opportunity i can't wait to add to the conversation about sales and and why it's not quite what we think it is Absolutely. And, um, you know, like I said, in the opening there, it's, it, there's a myth around it and, um, you know, the world's changed, hasn't it? I mean, that, that's, the, that's the biggest play that I think I want to say on this. So just to sort of give uh, London a bit more of an intro, um, you can connect with London on LinkedIn and that's uh, linkedin.com, I-N uh, forward slash London Porter. That's L-A-N-D-O-N hyphen P-O-R-T-E-R. And don't worry if you're driving, please don't stop. Please don't try to write. These are going to be posted in the show notes on the usual channels. You can download it in the app and it'll be on in Apple iTunes, Stitcher and all the usual uh, favorite channels. You can hit up uh, London and his team on Facebook at Facebook, facebook.com, the sales gorilla, or in a group you can ju- request to join, which is called Gorilla Juice as well. Um, the website is thesalesgorilla.com. And also you can get started with London at thesalesgorilla.com forward slash join. And there's a whole host of resources there that I highly encourage you to go and check out. So before we kick off, I'd love to sort of just share a little bit about London's journey. It is pretty awesome, his bio. Spent 15 years in corporate sales, um, corporate America, cubicle nation, call it what you want, doesn't really matter. Uh, we've all been there to a degree or we know somebody who has. Uh, and London had the revelation, uh, revelation, and I absolutely love this. This is absolutely awesome. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, I am saying this exactly, but London had the revelation that he couldn't stand most of his clients. And uh, I think we've all been there and, uh, you know, pulling his hair out. And the little bit I've certainly got left, um, I think, has uh, contributed to the fact that, you know, there is clients there that do drive you insane. So he shifted away to a new way of client getting, and that way allowed him to spot, sort, and enroll what he calls the perfect fit clients. Um, and London believes that the global culture is, you know, tired of being sold to and talked at and that, you know, people have moved into relationship markets and social selling. And again, from what I see in the inbound and the HubSpot side of this, again, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so I certainly second that. Um, so you're going to love London's passion, his directness. Um, and again, I highly, highly recommend you go check out the sales gorilla and you can check out and search that online at hashtag the sales gorilla. So thanks again, London. And I hope that's uh, done justice to a little bit of your intro, but in your own words, I'd love you to sort of share how you got started, what your journey has been, the highs and lows, and then maybe what brought you up to the sales gorilla and uh, maybe throwing in the towel with some of those uh, corporate clients uh, that, you know, you couldn't stand. That, that's, a, that, that's the best line I've heard probably in 2019, if I'm being fair. Most right. realistic. So my journey really started right out of high school. Um, I went to become a chef. I had a couple of choices right out of high school. 
um, go learn how to build hot rods and muscle cars and be in the automotive industry, or I could go do the food thing. And the truth was I needed to do something to kind of get my dad off my back about what I'm going to do next, because really I had no idea. I had zero interest in school. Um, my, my dad had a, a, a boot and the attitude that you're going to do what you need to do. So I graduated high school early and I graduated with really decent grades, but I had no idea what I wanted to do. And I wasn't really interested in like traditional learning going to college. So I found myself um, about halfway through high school and my counselor came to me and he said, so you don't ditch classes, you get all of your work done and all of your teachers say that you're, you know, a little bit of a class clown, but totally easy to be around and respectful and all of that. But they all have told me that you just don't like it being here. And <laughs> like, what's the deal? And I said, I'm bored. I'm not learning about anything that I care to learn about. And he said, well, what do you want to do? And I said, man, I have no idea. And so we talked about it. And it was a really interesting because I'd never seen a high school counselor before. Yeah. It was a really interesting interaction. And we talked for about an hour and a half what do you do? What do you like to do? And well, so here's the deal. I'm the oldest grandkid on both sides. And so both my grandmothers were pretty young for grandmothers yep. and they grew up with their mothers cooking everything from scratch. So here's this little kid and it's kind of hard to tell in the video, but I'm an <laughs> eater. I love food, right? So they've got me standing, both my grandmothers, they've got me standing on the chair at the counter, learning how to cook from when I was like two or three on yeah. the other side of that my family's into cars and muscle cars and race cars and sports cars, and motorcycles. So after this conversation, um, he gave me two options, two opportunities. And I went and checked out both programs at a, a local college and I went for the food thing. And yeah. by doing the food thing, it helped me graduate early, which meant I didn't have to be there learning stuff I didn't care about. And I had already been spending time in the food industry working part-time from the day that I was legally allowed to have a job while in school, right? So, one thing I will say though, Landon, for sure is I think you should have chose the muscle cars. Uh, myself and Jamie, you met Jamie, Jamie, the producer earlier on today. Um, and um, we love drag racing. Uh, I used to work on a drag racing team uh, when I was 20 because I was started as a motor mechanic as well. And, and uh, I just want to sort of reference that. So I did a bit of work on a drag racing team. And there's a, there's a place down here in the UK called the Santa Pod where we, you know, we do the uh, finals and the top field stuff. And uh, I used to work on a funny car and uh, we follow all the Mopar stuff on the, the channels. There's a great Instagram channel, by the way. And I was no, we're totally off script here, but I really apologize. He's a real passion of mine and I'm hijacking Lambden's um, intro. So that's even worse as the host, but I've <laughs> got to get there. But there's a, there's an Instagram channel, which is uh, Mopar or no car. And uh, you just got to get into that type of stuff. So uh, I'm absolutely gutted, mate, that you went for this food, but I'm sure there's an happy outcome, but we absolutely love the muscle cars and, uh, credit to and kudos to the other side of the family over there. You know, that, that's our type of people. I just went from liking you to loving you <laughs> when you threw out the Mopar or no car because I'm a Mopar guy. Absolutely. Uh, you're, you're actually right. And I've, I've thought about it a lot. I'm, I'm in my early forties. So I've had 20 some years experience in the real world. Um, and I've often thought, what would my life be like if I went down that other road? Yeah. I still love food doing it for a paycheck eventually killed my passion for it. Oh, shit. Yet I've not met anybody in person that can outcook me. <laughs> and there's a whole story, like this is going to be a rad conversation. There's a whole story about that. But had I gone the car route, you and I would have never met. I'm almost certain I would not have ended up where I'm at, how I got here. Yeah. Um, but yes, I'm a Mopar guy. <laughs> so, late sixties, very early seventies, Plymouth, Dodge, Cr yeah. Mm -hmm. You got it. You got it. My favorite cars are 62 Impala and that's no, you know, whatever, but I absolutely love 62 Impalas and, yep. uh, you know, that's a Chevy sort of stuff thing from that side. But, uh, but the Mopar stuff, um, yeah, as a drag racer, 
you know, if you ain't into that, then you ain't a drag racer, you know. But as I said, the Chevy side of it, I do love the Impalas, but yeah. I'm, I'm all in when it comes to power and getting uh, some uh, information. What I'll do as well, and again, for the, for, the, for the drag racers out there, and you're probably thinking, hey, I joined this podcast to learn about client acquisition. What we're talking about that for is because these are the type of stories and conversations that really sort of build up. But what I'll do, London, I will send you some footage of some, uh, some Mopar stuff going down the strip at the Santa Pod after the show. But uh, tell me more about the food stuff. So you got into food um, and that was the journey, but you know, you fell out of love with it. Wow. You know, uh, was it just overdose? Like, uh, you know, you get fed up with chocolate with you work in a chocolate factory. Is it that sort of syndrome? Kind of. It's um, what it became was, well, so here's the food industry. The food industry is nuts. And there's a lot of industries that are nuts. Like, you know, the um, police industry, the people that are in it say, yeah, nobody is crazy like we are. And, and there's other industries like that. But chefs in general are nights, nice weekends and holidays. They really have no life other than their work and partying. <laughs> and that worked really well when I was in my late teens. But 50 hours a week plus going to school one day a week left me with no days off. Yeah. And I did that for four years. I worked under um, either 24, 25 actual chefs from either the Europe nations or Americans that were trained by, and it was an old school apprenticeship. So it was like old school hands on college. Yeah getting my butt kicked around the kitchen by these guys that were a little bit older than me, but just as nuts. And eventually it just became doing that thing for a paycheck and not the ability to have a life just yeah. kind of took the fun out of it. Yeah. It's a shame. So I spent four years doing that. I moved on after that and I was still in the food industry for a while, but it came down to nights, weekends and holidays don't work for raising little kids. Yeah, absolutely. My, my then wife and I had two little kids by the time I was in my early mid twenties yeah. and nights, weekends and holidays weren't working. And while the money was good, it was really good for two people, but it wasn't good enough for two people with two little kids. So yeah. I found myself in sales through a connection. I had a family connection. My uh, longtime friend of my dad's actually placed slightly aged higher end cars with private clients yeah, right. it's called wholesaling, right? If you get yeah. down to the, the basics of it, but it was mostly, so here's my other love in the car world. German sports cars. Like yeah. I drive an Audi, right? Yeah, love it. Um, so I spent a summer and change doing that with him and my sales career kind of took off. But what's interesting, and I've only just in the last couple of years begun to put together is that the relationships that I had with the crazies in the food industry primed me for dealing with sales and selling people, right? Yeah. And um, the cars, as well as a great background, I, I spent 20 odd years in the automotive industry, finance and leasing and John yep. started as a motor mechanic. And uh, yeah, we love German cars. And, you know, that, that, that sales sort of dynamic, I mean, you know, there's the old cliche of you know, cheese and used car salespeople. Yeah, so, um, you know, that, that, that cheese and used car salesperson, um, it, 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 that stigma of that is not always right. And there is a good career to be made out of it. I actually got trained at BMW back in 1994 uh, and I started in my sales career and, and I moved out of being a mechanic and then jumped into being a salesperson with BMW corporate in 1994. And, you know, that's what BMW, what I call was BMW, the limited stock availability, long waiting list, no discount arguably, I know they're going to kill me for this, but there was actually a cartel running in the area where dealers used to cartel should stop discounting. But um, it was the best background I ever had, London, in being brought up in an executive premium German brand franchise. And the training I received at BMW was immense. And, you know, and I think similar to you, I don't think if I'd have not got into that, I certainly wouldn't be sat here today either because that was great grounded. And uh, I understand it. And I'm absolutely on point with you on that. Yeah, my dad spent 20 plus years in the car sales industry, mainly working for the German brands here in the States and his yeah. good friend. That's how they met. Um, so, and I often use that like in my, in my Facebook group, in my world, I often use that as a distinction, although it's not accurate as much as a lot of people think it is that idea of the bad use car sales guy. Yep. Right. And everybody understands that because that's been such a thing for so long, even though it's actually not accurate Correct. for the most part. Um, but yeah, the 
cars and food. So <laughs> it's, little, it's a great balance though. It's a great balance. Yep. So a little bit more on, on my journey with this, I end up in sales. I'm, I'm a young guy. I just came out of the, the food industry and I've been around selling all my life. My, my dad and my uncles and my dad's friends. And at that time, when I was younger, I was what I would consider an extrovert. I could people with anybody. I, yep. you know, it's, people were people. Everybody was cool. The ones that weren't didn't matter. Um, and so I, I fell into the sales gig, and I had all of these natural qualities that just lent themselves to me being able to do well out of the gate in sales. And I'll get to that here in a minute. But to to kind of put a um, a round understanding of my sales journey. I did that car thing with a family friend from home for a summer and change. And then the following year, I ended up in the mortgage industry. One of the guys that I met that I sold a car to yep. was 1972 Ford Bronco um, was a mortgage guy. And he was looking for somebody that would do cold calling between four and 8 PM during the week to help find people that wanted to refi. So that was my real intro into the sales world. The car thing that was totally different. Yeah. So I spent about six months doing the cold calling for that guy. And then I ended up being hired by a company that was owned by a friend of his. And I spent four years in change from that point on doing mortgages and then into selling real estate. And then if you think back to the time period, that was 2004. Wow. 2005, <laughs> right? Saw it coming. 2006, I was like, oh no, this isn't going to be good. I did this to take care of my new little kids, right? Yeah. This looks like it might be bad. So I ended up working for a company that sold asset management and protection globally to corporations. And what I mean when I say that is everything from commercial collections yep. all the way to credit insurance and everything in between. So I spent 10 years in that industry selling to businesses yep. to protect them from their business with other businesses. And for everybody listening who has an idea that sales people in the car industry can be bad, like bad salespeople, they don't hold a candle to the people that sell collections right. and they don't hold a candle to the people that sell commercial collections. Yeah. It is, it's down there. And I learned all the good, dirty tricks <laughs> on top of my natural knack, which I'll talk about in a minute. Yep. I learned all of it because there's a lot to be said for leveraging the psychological triggers that you can to turn somebody into a client. Yep. Here's the problem. I'm now in my late twenties and my kids are three, four, five, six years old. And I all of a sudden begin to realize I'm not really liking my life. And yeah. this is the truth. And, and people that know me and have been in my world have heard me say this. It was a Wednesday morning. It was 438. And I know that because I looked down at the clock and I'm on my way an hour across town in traffic to the office to sell these services and these products. And I look at myself in the mirror and I say, I bleeping hate you. <laughs> it had gotten so bad that it wasn't, I don't really like work. Yeah. Like I'm kind of frustrated. No, I, I was at the point where I hated me because my life was so bad. And it now telling this story, looking back at it, it wasn't immediately apparent what it was. It didn't occur to me for several weeks and, and then a couple of months that, Oh, my frustration stemming from having to deal with all of these clients, yeah. because in that industry, you don't make your money when you sell the thing. You make your money when you bring them on as a client and then maintain them for a period of time because you sell to them constantly. Yeah. And I had a big book of 400 active clients and I couldn't stand literally about 98% of them. And what eventually occurred to me at the same time, my kids are going from little kids to they're starting to have their own idea that they're an individual personalities out there and they come relationship in. changes. Yeah. So it it's over this course and it was over the course of a summer that about three months that I realized, ah, this is why I'm not happy. Oh, that makes sense. And what it eventually came down to is I, had, I, I was so good at, if you stayed on the phone with me, you had to hang up or you bought That's all there was to it. Right. 
I was so good at bringing clients on and I developed, I was by this time, I was in that, that industry selling corporate finance solutions for five years. I was yeah. good. I was one yeah, of the best. You polished it up by then. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden here I'm faced with this, uh-oh, I'm so good at this that I can just make it happen and I can make it rain yeah. and I'm miserable. Yeah. Oh no. And now, you know, this is like, this is typical younger male. I'm painted in a corner. I've literally got the golden handcuffs on. I'm making yeah. so much money, but I'm living at those means. Yeah. And what am I going to do? Because this thing that I'm that good at, if I keep doing that, I'm going to jump out it. the window yeah, into the parking lot. It's going to destroy. And do you know what? The, you know, for all the entrepreneurs out there, you know, the, the thing at the moment is, and it's slightly off, off topic, Landon, but I'll just cover it. Um, is, there's so much, you know, publicity around mental health at the moment. And, you know, it maybe wasn't as obvious back then. And, uh, you know, I interviewed a, a guy called George Hodgson here in the UK. He's a, a big mental health uh, campaigner. He, he, you know, featured on things like BBC television and things like that. Um, and if you are in that dark place where London was, um, I had a similar experience in 2012 where, you know, the, the world crashed uh, and things like that as part of the recession. If you are in there, there is always help. There is a recovery. It's about that, you know, there is help out there. If you want to shoot me a message, use the hashtag the open mic. If you want to share experiences with uh, London, you know, I'm sure he'll sort of, um, you know, uh, reach out to you. You can use hashtag, you know, the, the sales gorilla. Uh, also, go check George Hodgson out as well at Mason the Shoop. And again, I'll put that link at the bottom of the show notes as well, because if you are in those dark places, um, there is help out there. There is people that have been through it and uh, there is people there to get you through the other side. So it is always worthwhile to say that um, because I know we get comments coming in where they're saying, yeah, I'm, I'm in this dark. It's, it's great advice, Mike. And the influencer that you was interviewing today was awesome but I just can't seem to get started because I've got this elephant on my back or, you know, and I just can't seem to do that. So don't sit there, don't suffer. You know, as a community, we're here to help and just reach out to us um, or, you know, reach out to us even some professional help. Even if you start with something like the Samaritans or something like that, if you don't want to talk to me or anybody else, you know, but we are here to help. So just what, thanks for letting me do that, uh, Landon. It's pretty important for me to make sure that, you know, entrepreneurship can be a dark place and, um, you know, the, you know, the, these podcasts, they're all great ideas and everybody wants to implement but Sometimes people just can't get started. So I appreciate you sharing that buddy as well. And thanks for just let me uh, plug that out there to uh, the people who are maybe not in the best place. Uh, you know, you can get through it. Absolutely not a problem. Um, there's, <laughs> I've been in those shoes Yeah, and you don't know that it's okay to ask for help. Like, yeah. So I go through this experience, this chair that I'm sitting in, it's old and beat up. And there's part, there's a reason that I keep it. This was my chair at that office. Wow. And I, over this period of time, like here's part of the story that, that I haven't shared with most of my audience that happened on that Wednesday morning. And it took me about three months to figure out like what legitimately was my problem. And I was faced with these options of, I keep doing this and I just grow this outer shell. And I, I, I understand that that's part of the gig and I just don't like the people that I have to work with and it ruins your days and all of that. Or I can figure out how to do it another way, but boy, that's scary because I've now at this point, I've spent 10 years learning how to do the sales the way that I do it. Yep. The other option literally is to go do something else. And the last option, which I thought about actually on one occasion, the day I told my boss, I'm done, I quit. And this is the part of the story nobody's really heard is I actually had this chair in my hands up off the ground, ready to throw it through my office window. And I was going to jump out the window. And that's not, that's not for shock value. That's literally where I was at with my life because of my ability to do this thing we're talking about client acquisition yep. the wrong way. Yep. I quit my job that day. I had the biggest book in the company and my bosses were like, you're out of your mind. They, they actually didn't let me quit. And I didn't hear, I didn't find out about this until later, but they just put me on. Okay, cool. We're going to act like you quit, but we know you'll be back. And within about a month and a half, two months, we were having conversations and I was back. The short of the long is I figured out what made my life so miserable. And it was, I had learned how to do the sales thing so well, the way yeah. that everybody teaches it. 
right? All the way back a hundred years, all the big guys, here's how to do sales. And I was miserable. Yeah. So I figured out a way to be as good and actually better at the ability to bring on clients without having to do any of the manipulation, coercion, nonsense, BS. And I got to choose the people that I wanted to work with, which automatically went from, okay, cool. Your quota is 300 phone calls a day and you got to bring in 20 clients a month to literally 10 calls a month to people that I'd scoped out a little bit. Yep. And it drastically changed my sales career fast. And here's the wrap up. Fast forward about another five years, I decided to leave sales. My wife and I go create this parenting thing because I was done. I'd had enough, right? Um, my wife and I went and created a parenting course, a parenting coaching, a parenting Facebook group, and it was taken off. And I found myself in a world with a group of people that were learning Facebook ads about yep. three years ago. And I'd taken some Facebook ads courses, but there was something new about this and whatever. And through having conversations, I build relationships. I'm having conversations with other people that are going through the same course and they're helping me with, you know, I'm asking them questions like, how should I run this ad? Should I do video? Should I do like, well, they're helping me. So I'm getting to know them and I end up helping them with their sales conversations, their client acquisition, how to, and literally within five with, within a week, in three days, I had five people, dude, you need to teach this. Dude, you need to teach this. I was like, dude, no, I don't. No, no, no. I'm like, done with it. <laughs> Here we are two and a half years later, and this thing, the sales gorilla, just totally took off on its own. Um, and it's been, it's been a very fun, very challenging, very interesting and rewarding ride. So here we are today. But you're getting to do what, it, you know, you're getting to, I suppose, because to stick around, would it, would it be fair to say, London, that to stick around sales, and I, look, I get the fact of the clients, the industry, the, uh, maybe it's a bit harsh to say malpractice, but like you say, down at the bottom and doing some of those strategies and tactics that some of those uh, industries that maybe promote, but take that out of it. But, you know, naturally, to stick around for 10 years or so in sales, you know, you, you probably loved the sales, didn't like the environment. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's incredible, it's, it's humbling that you figured out that way to sort of get the balance to sort of say, you know, to a degree, why the hell should I actually, or why the heck should I actually give up what I like doing? Um, why can't I just do that the way that I want to do it? And maybe that's a relevant situation. And, but tell me, you know, when you, you know, when you see, I've, I've written it down at 4.38 on a Wednesday morning. Um, what was it? What was it that just, Start. You know what was it that piece that just said I've had enough? When you, you know, maybe looked in the rearview mirror of the of the, of the car, uh, what was it? Because I'm going to share with you a quick story about 19 uh, no two year 2000 after you shared that with me sure. uh, about something that just made me trip. Which is uh, you mentioned a lot of people don't know. This is something that a lot of people don't know about me as well. But tell me what was it that made you snap or look yourself in the eye and said enough's enough? Sure. So it it was not that it was totally good up to that day. And it wasn't even that it was kind of okay up to that day. Yeah. Driving across Metro Denver in rush hour traffic <laughs> and I can drive, I'm a car guy and I can drive and the frustration and the anxiety and the irritation that comes with being in rush hour traffic to go to a place where I only like one or two of the people that I work with in the office to have to spend all day dealing with what I termed at that time, stupid people. Yeah. And it, they weren't stupid. They just, we weren't a fit. Yeah. It was so bad that I hated Sundays. I didn't like yeah. Sunday or Saturday nights. Like it was getting further and further oh, and further wow. back. Um, my relationship with my kids was always anger, frustration, yeah. tense because I was right. My relationship with my, with my woman in, We've got that relationship. It's perfect. We don't fight. We're, yeah. We spend every waking hour together. We run a business together. It's amazing. Yeah. My friends, I was arguing and getting in, in disagreements and like it was everything, everything in my life to the point yeah. where I didn't like being in my own head talking to myself. Yeah. And it just was- Just overflowed. It just, just the glass went over the top. Yep. I saw myself in the mirror getting ready to go fight the traffic again and it was like- no, <laughs> there's got to be something better, hasn't there, out there? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I get it. I understand it. 
Um, we, we opened up a wheeled asset finance company in automotive. So we used to lease cars or a finance company and build a business from nothing to over three and a half million pounds. So at the time, that's about $6 million in, in your sort of currency change at that time, maybe about six and a half million dollars. Uh, and I got a partner and that partner, he was very egocentric. He liked the title. We were doing all the graft, bringing in the revenue with the expertise. He was lording around. And, um, you know, we'd had the Florida holidays, you know, we'd had the big house, we'd had the cars, we'd had the money with the, the shiny credit cards, you know, all as a success out of that. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny you say, uh, Wednesday, this was a Thursday for me. You know, I, I got in a car on Thursday and, I, and whilst I didn't hate um, going to work, I didn't hate the clients that I dealt with. I didn't hate what I did. We we're pretty good at what we did. We'd created some un- unique things in real asset finance. But I hated my business partner uh, to the fact that, you know, you know, I'm fairly humble. I'm, I'd rather help somebody than, you know, give them a penny than take a penny off them. And, uh, but I'm still commercially minded. But, and, you know, it, it really stung with me. And, and I didn't say anything to my, well, she's now my wife. She was my fiance at the time. Um, and I just jumped in my car. Uh, I can remember I used to have a BMW 3 when I IS. Uh, sorry, probably a BMW 328 IS, a uh, big coupe, six in the coupe. Um, and I'm thinking, well, if I jack this in, I'm going to lose the car. I thought it doesn't matter anymore. I'm not going to lose my house. I've got enough money. Um, and I drove to work. It was only a six-mile drive into work. And I comes into the car park. I gets out. And I thought, today's the day. And, and it was there in the car park because I was shutting the door. Walked across the road, up the stairs, went into the office. And Steve, my partner at the time, always got in early. And uh, we were only, only two in the office. And he said, how are you doing? I went, yeah, I just need to speak to you. I'd not rehearsed it. I'd not thought about it. But that sh- slamming that car, it just banged like that. That just, I've had enough. I'm leaving. And um, I said, I'm leaving. He goes, what do you mean you're leaving? I said, I'm, I'm leaving. He said, what for? I said, I don't like you. <laughs> so I have no personal, <laughs> generally not personal. I just don't like you. I don't, I don't think we're fit. I think we've grown out of each other. And, you know, you're spending money crazy. Sometimes we struggle. You're spending money crazy. You can't keep a lid on it. You want the title. You want the glory. You don't want to put work in. Look, I'm not being offensive to you. I'm just going to go. You, you know, there's nothing you're going to say. I'm going to go. It's just about working an exit deal to go. Uh, and within three or four days, we'd work that out. And within uh, six weeks, because I did a bit of a handover, I'd gone. And then I, I went to the States and spent some time. And Jamie, who you've just met, he was three months old. Um, yeah, no, sorry, 15 months old. Sorry, 15 months old. Yeah. Uh, and I just had enough and I, I didn't want to be associated with that people anymore. And the moral of the story, Steve, and if you are listening, um, you know full well we went sort of set up another business and uh, we grew that business to 12 million pounds, which is about 18, 90 million dollars uh, when we did it on his own the right way. So that's, that was my payback. We went and did it right as opposed to being suffocated by that ego. But it does, it just snaps at you like that, London. And um, I think if any people are out there and you are stuck in that, not false environment, but you're still where you're at. You know, Jim Rohn talks about, you know, every day, uh, you know, you've got to spend a day. That's just one day less you've got to spend with, you know, with your family or your friends. And, you know, works either a necessity or if you're financially independent, you maybe can live for your own resources. Fine. But, you know, these days ain't going back. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so you've got to do what you love. And if you can mix what you're doing, what you love with, you know, helping others and, and earning a living, you know, I would much rather earn half what I earn and do what I love uh, than go and, you know, uh, this is a stereotype, but go and sit in cubicle nation being drilled by some, you know, person who I don't like or I don't believe in. So that's my little story. Um, and it was a car door slam for me, but I thought, right, and that, you know, and I thought, if I have to leave this car in the car park and get the bus home, I don't care. And that's the point that I got to. Yeah, it was it was literally looking up from brushing my teeth and seeing myself in the mirror. And there was a a moment of clarity and a moment of honesty of it is so bad. The only thing that ties all of that together is you. I don't like you. And I said that to myself out loud. My wife heard me. She said, what? <laughs> and I, that was it. I was like, I couldn't even talk about it. Um, she thought she, she, she didn't think you were talking about you, uh, her, did she? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Interesting, interesting time. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's kind of been my journey up to this point. Yeah. That's amazing. And, and, and thanks ever so much for sharing that. I mean, there's so many things in common, different parts of the world, um, you know, uh, you know, different circumstances, but you know, it's amazing how you, you, you know, sometimes this is me. I'm speaking about me here from 1996, halfway through 1996 to certainly that point in 2000, the money was flowing and I mean, flowing in, you know, droves, you know, it was ridiculous. 
And you liked, I felt I was lying to myself through that period um, because I thought, oh, the money's coming. I don't ever want it to stop. But they get to a point where the materialistic stuff of holidays, conservatories, houses, cars, you know, credit cards or, you know, the color of the credit card or whatever it would be, you know, the property portfolio that we amassed, it didn't matter anymore. It just mm-hmm. doesn't matter anymore. And I get it when you're looking at me and think, I never actually thought that I'm lying to myself or I'm thinking, but I thought, you know, I just can't. Need it. I'd rather have nothing than do this. And, mm-hmm. and it's interesting because, it takes a brave person to do that. And uh, the longer you stay in it, the more poisoned it gets. And mm-hmm. I think if I'd have stayed in that another year or so, I think, I'm not saying I would have actually killed somebody, but, you know, I, I, I think I'd have gone off the rails with it because yeah. it, it just got to the point. And to me, that was the parachute cord. I just pulled it. And I'll tell you what, if you sat out there thinking about it, you know, what's to do, what not to do, we're not legal advisors, we're not business advisors here, but, you know, take a good think about it, assess your situation, weigh up the pros and cons. But if you need to pull that parachute cord, that's what you need to do. And I had no idea, I don't know if you can relate to this, London, I had no idea what I was going to, what I wanted or what I wanted to do. But I'll tell you what, I knew what I didn't want. And, mm. and, and that was to stop where, it, where that was. Yep, that's exactly accurate. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks again for sharing that story, London. That background and that journey certainly resonates with me. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I think for other people in that place, then ultimately, you know, take a good look at it and see where we go. So talk to us a little bit now that journeys will transition out into from what was into, you know, the business flourishing. Tell us a little bit, just, just give us a summary before we get into some more detailed questions and deep dives. Tell us a little sure. bit, if somebody said to you, you know, there's the old classic elevator pitch or whatever it might be. By the way, I've got a story on elevator pitches about the real reason behind it, not what you think it may be. I don't know if you've come across that as well. Uh, but um, if, if somebody said, sales gorilla, 30 seconds or less, what is it? Just give us a sort of summary of what that is. Sure. The summary of it is we're all humans, which means that we naturally like some humans and we naturally don't like other humans. And if you can figure out who it is that you like and why you like them, client acquisition becomes superfluous. The marketing's on point and the selling doesn't matter because they sell themselves. That's what this is about. Absolutely. And the format and the business model that you operate there from a coaching perspective, a group perspective, just explain to that for us. So the people listening, if they want to jump over to, you know, the salesgorilla.com or something like that, they can get a, you know, a better understanding of it. So if you just give us a bit of a background about that. Sure. There's three ways to get clients, learn how to go get them the right way without having to become a black belt in sales. Right. Yeah. The second way is how do you get clients coming to you? and have an actual system without any of the fakery BS automations that none of the platforms like, how do you get them coming to you? And then the third way to get clients is to build strategic partnerships, alliances with other people that serve your audience in a slightly different manner, build a relationship with them. So it's just an automatic when they need your thing, you're, you've got people rolling out the red carpet to you. Those are the three ways to get clients. Yeah. I've got, courses on that. Our group is about that. And I, I mentor a group of people on that higher tier, how to go find strategic partners to bring you the best clients without it being the referral partner tit for tat. You know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's not how referral partnerships actually work. So that's kind of what I do in this world. Um, And it's all based around figuring out who you're for and only speaking to them. And if you can do that, when you can do that, this whole client acquisition thing just works itself out. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And it's and so much resonates. And, you know, it, 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 like it's knowing your audience and knowing what you're about and knowing how you can help. So when we look at it in a bit more detail, um, you know, I, I cut here in my questions and my research, the relationship economy, you know, give me an overview on what do you actually mean by that? Because, one thing that I, I try and get to down on, on the podcast is to, to, to take that down, not just one level, but two or three, because, mm-hmm. you know, there's so many gurus, you know, yourself, um, London out there, you know, some are genuine, of course, and others aren't. And mm-hmm. they use this language and they mask normality with language that, hey, I'm different in the marketplace because of this. But then when you ask them to explain that, they always seem to sort of either fall short or, you know, it's so, I don't know, fake. And uh, I know the, the depth that you do, I've seen your stuff here. It, it's that far, it couldn't be anything further than that. So tell me when you talk about the relationship economy, 
give me an overview of that. What's your view on that? And uh, how should the audience sort of take that and, and, and address that in their own business? Sure. So 20 years ago, before we had the internet, as connected as you could be was to your inner circle of friends and family, neighbors, the people that you worked with and the people that you knew from Boy Scouts or from church or whatever, right? Super small network. And that was the extent of it. Now we're totally connected. You can go connect with anybody, literally. If they've got an internet connection, you can connect with them. Fundamentally change the dynamics of marketing and sales because why do we use Google search? Why do we use Yelp reviews? Why do we look, why do we have the ability to do reviews on everything Amazon? Yep. When we come back to it, if you're looking to buy something, watch a movie, go to dinner somewhere, what do you do? You talk to the people that you know, like, and trust and value their opinion on so you can get a sense without having to do mountains of due diligence. Yep. It's if you go back to when we were in the trees and living in caves and you came across this new thing and you said to your friend, should I eat this or not? And they said, no, 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 no. Don't eat that. Okay, cool. Well, we're connected and everybody who's selling something is leveraging whether they're doing it well or not. They're leveraging social media to build an audience. And I will say one thing about those guys that are doing it in our opinion, totally inauthentic and they're using all the the manipulation and the coercion, all the BS. What's interesting is on a macro level, they are still attracting that perfect audience. If they love those people, yeah, They're getting those people that like the 30 year old dude who's a life coach who can tell you how to fix everything in front of a Ferrari and a big mansion and all the girls. What he rented for the day because he doesn't actually own it. (laughs) Exactly. So the relationship economy is essentially this. If you have the understanding that some people are going to like me, some people aren't, and give yourself permission that that's okay because if you're honest, you don't like everybody either. That means that naturally some people resonate and relate with us. If you can figure out how to be honest with yourself and just speak who you are, and that's within the confines of the marketplace you're trying to serve, the people that naturally gravitate to you just begin to bubble up and come out of the woodwork. And now the no like and trust and having to do the sales thing, that doesn't matter. That's the relationship economy. We all have access to it. Yeah. And what do you think the biggest mistake is, London, where people are not leveraging that, if that makes sense? Because, you know, I, I'm 1,000% on point with you. We all have access to it, but it's like anything. You know, you, you, you maybe you, you've got a gym, you know, a cross trainer at home. You put on a few pounds and, you know, you're looking at the cross trainer and it's like getting on that cross trainer and that discipline. What do you think the biggest mistake is, people? Because do they, do they just not understand it? Do they know, not know how to get on it? Do they not know how to leverage it? What, what, do, you, what do you come across when you, you sort of coach people and uh, you, know, you put people through your groups and things like that? People have the wrong idea as to what sales is. And they have, real, they have no real understanding of who it is they want as a client. They know they want clients. They think they need leads. Yep. They think they need to learn how to sell those leads and turn them into clients. What they don't understand is that they're not looking for your thing. They're not looking for being sold. They're not looking for that. They're looking for a solution and then somebody that they can relate to. And this is the thing that the prospects don't understand. I've got this BS meter that just starts going off. And that means I'm not buying from you. I don't, I can't explain it. But if I'm, if I'm going, man, this is awesome, man, that's awesome. Man. I really dig this guy. Like, holy crap, this is my guy. Yeah. And he's got my solution. Guess who I'm buying from? Yeah, you're going to buy from that guy, aren't you? It's simply, and just, if you're driving, pull over, back up, put the hazards on, write this down. You know, when you're looking at what you're saying there is what London's saying is, you know, they're not interested in whether you sell conservatories or you sell cars or you sell life insurance. That's looking at the result. And I see so many people sort of, you know, spouting and spewing over people. We, 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 we call it we diarrhea. You know, we, we, they're not interested. They're interested in how do you make my life easy? How, what, how do you look after my family if I die with this insurance? You know, this car, it's, 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 it, it, this great example. And I forget which book I saw this in. So uh, I, I apologize. I'm not going to credit the author here. My mind's gone blank. 
But there's an example where they say, you know, added value and expected value. And, you know, if you buy a pair of premium speakers or luxury speakers, um, you know, you're not, you know, it's not the quality of the sound that people, you know, it's, you're making them feel like a rock star, your head banging, blah, 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 from that sort of side. They're not buying the premium sound, they're buying the feeling and the emotion and, and yeah, that, that, that's what they've got. So, you know, what I'm saying here as well is what I echo totally, stop talking about yourself, stop talking about what you do, think about the end result that you get for the client and how that either solves the problem, overcomes the challenge, frustration, pain point, you know, or if you are in luxury or, you know, uh, emotive sort of sales, you know, how it makes them feel, you know, they think of the rock star with the speakers, you know, from there. So, you know, you're okay to take the hazards off now and keep driving, but thanks for covering that last I appreciate it, buddy. But it's important because people miss that point time after time after time after time. Um, a quick example, if somebody says to you, what do you do? Don't say you build conservatories. Just say you expand families living and help them enjoy the, the back garden and the summer better. And people say, how do you do that? It opens a conversation up and then you can go from there. But if you say I build conservatories, you're going to think, oh God, a double glazing salesman. I'm going to run a mile. Excuse me, all double glazing salesman listening. But uh, you know, ultimately, you, you, know, you create the increased family living. Improve, not move. That's what you do. You sell that benefit. And uh, you know, that's something that you know, maybe a little bit over what you've just done there, London. But it's what I see here in the UK. Okay. when I work with our clients in our agency, I see it all the time and it's getting that mindset. And like you said, it's, it, it's that discipline and understanding about what you're about, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Cool. Fantastic. So relationship marketing and how it's done well. Talk to me a little bit about your view on that. Um, and when, I suppose let's get started about what do you mean by relationship marketing? And I know we've touched on dipped in and out of it, but drill down for us a little bit on that point. Sure. So the act of learning how to be a good salesperson in a traditional manner is learning how to manufacture relatability. Nice. What all of us humans want, especially now that we're connected and we can kind of see through the BS, is we're looking for real connection with people that we actually relate to. We do this naturally. This is attraction. This is dating. This is how humans are still on this planet. We figured out we do and don't like some people. If you can figure that out and understand that relationship economy, you got to be honest with yourself. If I bring this client into my business, would I want them to be stuck at my home for Thanksgiving week because it's snowed and I have to deal with them in front of my family for a week? <laughs> right? That's, that's an interesting take. If, and, and here's the thing. A lot of people misunderstand me. I'm not saying that they have to come to my house for a week at Thanksgiving to be my client. I'm just saying if that would go over well and you'd have a really good time and so would they, guess what? They're, They're your people. Yeah. Relationship Absolutely. marketing. I know what I do. I know who I do it for. I understand how to market the thing. These are the basics that yeah. everybody has to have down. Who is it for? What's it do? Why do they want it? Why do they need it? Right. And you got to be able to speak the, the right way to do it. But the relationship marketing piece is do not be afraid to be who you are. Yeah. I've got a giant beard. I've got crazy hair. I don't wear collared shirts. I smoke and I cuss. And if people don't like that, generally they ain't my people. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And absolutely. That's relationship marketing is, hey, I'm not here to put on a show. I'm not here to be anything other than exactly how I am. Because if you end up obligating me with your money, I'm going to have to deal with you. And that goes back to what I learned in the sales world. Absolutely. If you obligate me with your money, I now have to deal with you. How much does that money have to be worth for me to justify dealing with somebody I do not want to have as a client? Yeah. There really is no amount. No, it, 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 it's not the monetary value then, is right. it? It, it? It's a peace of mind value. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So when we just, just jumping back onto relationship marketing, um, you know, if people haven't quite figured out, you know, what they're, what they're about, you imagine them, some businesses are like adolescent teenagers. They haven't quite worked out what they're going to be or what they're, you know, they've got a lot of hormones going off. What, how do you, how do you approach that? How do you, 
how do you sort of say, hey, take a step back, back up a couple of steps here and let's, let's get started here. You know, so, you know, there will be some listeners here thinking, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. But hey, I don't know if I'm here or here or, you know, I don't know if I do want the crazy beard or the crazy hair. At least you've got the hair, Landon. Mine's out just about falling out with all the stress and the hassle with all those customers that, you know, we don't want and things like that. But yeah. how, how do people get started to figure that out? What, what's your advice and guidance around that? If you don't know what it is that you want to do, you don't have a client acquisition problem. If you don't know what you want to do as a business, you've got a, I I don't know what I want to do problem. Now, how to validate that, if you take a guess at, I think I want to do this thing, guess what? You got to go talk to a few people. I say generally between six and 12 people and have a full conversation about doing that thing together. And if it seems like, wow, that could be really cool. Fantastic. Um, To your point, probably 70% of the people that came into my world, the first 18 months that I did this 70% started in my world, they were doing this and decided, Oh, that's what I want to do because I, I teach a thing called genius zone. And quickly, genius zone is how to figure out if what you're doing is the thing you should be doing. And it's simple, right? Um, But to validate if you should be doing that or if you should show up that way, you got to talk to people. And this is the self-awareness piece that people have a problem with relationship marketing is I'm not sure that I can be myself and demonstrate that publicly. Again, you don't have a client acquisition problem. You've got a a self-esteem and a self-worth discussion you need to have with yourself to give yourself permission to just be who you are and understand there are going to be people that don't like it and don't like you and you have to be okay with that. Yep. Yep. Once they get over that, the rest of it's easy. That's awesome. And, you know, that all that piece there, um, it's just so, so relevant. And I hope you got some value out of that. So if you are stuck on a ledge, um, and again, you know, you're not quite sure. I highly recommend you jump over to the salesgorilla.com uh, forward slash join. Uh, check out uh, London's programs um, and, you know, start to work that out, you know, because, yeah, you can sit there and f- try and figure it out yourself. Um, and, you know, another thing, which is not for today's conversation, but, you know, lo- work out the cost of lost opportunity. How long, like London, will you sit in a job that's driving you insane, ruining your family life, taking time away from your kids? You know, maybe even, you know, you know, male suicide, female suicide, up in, you know, the mental health thing I touched earlier. And it may not get to that. And I don't want to paint such a black picture. And that's not linked to me promoting Landon's courses at all. All I'm just trying to say is that, you know, you can figure it out yourself. And if that's fine, there's plenty of free resources online. But also sometimes if you are ready to go, you know, I'm always a big believer, work with the professionals. I mean, you're going to shortcut that process and you're really going to, you know, get get moving. Um, so that's a great way and an explanation. Thanks for covering that, uh, Landon. That's awesome. So, it links into this is a real topic that I absolutely uh, am fascinated with, and that's social selling. Tell me why it's so essential in your mindset, set, and uh, you know, in the, in the process that you take with clients. There's this idea that a lot of people who don't think they're good at selling, and they're out there, whether it's with me or any of the other people in the the industry who can teach you how to sell or market your thing. There's this idea that um, I, I'm, I'm afraid to sell like, like I should, I, yeah, I've got this thing and it's amazing and you can pay me for it, but I don't want to sell it. <laughs> That's not right. That's not what this is. Selling is, this is the thing that I do. This is who I do it for. This is how I do it. This is why you might consider doing it with me. And oh, here, by the way, here's how you buy my thing. That message, that uh, the ability to express that message to the marketplace, obviously not like that verbatim, but in the capacity of, yeah, this is the thing I do and you can pay me for it. Um, You have to have the ability to do that. Social selling is the marketing of that in a way that's not buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Social selling is the demonstrating of what it is and how you do it and why you think it's cool and who it's for. But at the end of the day, both of these two questions that you've asked me, relationship marketing and social selling, the bottom line is showing up for your market. And that's what humans are looking for. You don't got to have a million pieces of content like Gary Vee, but 
if I show up on your LinkedIn or your Facebook or your website and there's like point A, point B by my thing, guess what? They don't have enough information to validate you're the one to do it with. Yep. And would you say then that what is the, is, is it, should people just go out there and start creating articles, creating content with that in mind? You know, I know we've got things to, to, to cover in and around that, but at the social selling piece, is it worthwhile? You know, I say, I don't, I can't believe how much content Gary Vee actually pours out. It's just immense, you know, it's, I think he said document, don't create or something, but um, should everybody go out there and create articles? Should they create it in a certain way to support themselves in social selling or is there a better way of doing that? The way that I teach it is the people, market sophistication, how, how educated is your market, right? Do they know they've got a problem? Do they understand their solutions? Do they know that you're an option, right? Market sophistication. If your audience like understands what I just said, here's the bottom line. Yeah. We as consumers, regardless of what we're buying, are going to go look into deeper if we're looking for a solution to a problem yeah. and we're introduced to somebody that might have that solution. The way that we do this is with a perfect client funnel. Let's use LinkedIn, for example. Yep. You've got your LinkedIn profile. You've got your LinkedIn picture. You've got the, the positioning statement. You've got the, the, the summary underneath that. And then you've got the ability to have a few pieces of content that answer the specific questions that your perfect for you client has. Yep. There's generally between three and six pieces of content to say, here's what it is. Here's who it's for. Here's how it works. If you've got questions, let's talk. But that core couple pieces of content need to address this. Your market's big want there's generally between three and six other symptomatic or situational problems that support that big want not being met currently. Yep. And demonstrated through your personality that you are the one for them. If you can do that, now you can go create whatever kind of content you want. I'm prolific at creating content. You're prolific at cre creating content. Other people can be, but don't want to. Yeah. So he said, don't want sort of situation there, isn't right. it? You, you, need to, you need to be able to show up in front of your marketplace. And the, the ingredient we haven't discussed about this is that's the key ingredient. Really understanding who your actual market audience is, is a micro segment of the main market you serve. Awesome. And that's kind of what I'm known for. ICA, ideal client avatar. I walk people through a process to understand from a them perspective and their clients, the market's stance, who those people are. You yeah. just got to show up in front of them a little bit. If you've answered their questions and you post a piece of content once a month, you can get it done, yeah. but it certainly doesn't need to be 10 pieces of content a day. No, absolutely. And I suppose relevancy comes into that, doesn't it, London, at the end yeah. of the day. And, you know, if you can put that, well, just uh, totally off script here. And so I apologize for throwing you a, a left field one here. Um, what do you think about those people who are out there trying to be somebody else, uh, creating content, trying to be somebody else? Because when you scroll the feed, they're all there. And, and to me, it looks as plastic population. I call them the plastic population because mm -hmm. these people either trying to be Gary Vee or these people trying to be, you know, Frank Kern or these people trying to be whoever. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, personally, I'll go first. You know, I just think they should pack up and go home and, you know, get alive because, you know, I think the real people and the real content creators with the authenticity and the real value and, like you say, the show, what do I do? How does it help you? How, you know, uh, here's some information around it. How does it solve the problem? Here's the end result. Oh, and by the way, here's how you buy it. And whatever format that is, it could be a podcast, it could be a, live, a webinar, a download, a group, a membership site, uh, you know, a blog. It doesn't really matter. Um, you could be just on the public speaker circuit like we are. But, you know, ultimately, um, what do you think to the, what I call the plastic population? I call them tryhards. And I think I, here's, here's the thing the, the vast majority of them are really good people and they yeah. just haven't given themselves permission to do them yeah. right. Here's, here's the thing that I want every, if you, if you've listened this far into the show, I want you to take this away. There is only one person on this planet who can be as you, as you can stop trying to be like somebody else. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And I love the try hard. <laughs> That's right. And, you know, I think that is a big part about giving permission. Um, I remember we, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we did a, a, a speech and at a keynote at a DM a digital marketer event last week in London. Uh, and my style, and, uh, you know, I said to Jamie all the time, it is what it is. I get up there, I'm high energy, I move about a lot on the stage, and I'm actually yelling at you at some points. And it's like, hey, you know, you've got to do this stuff. And uh, I remember Marcus Murphy from LinkedIn, he comes up after us and he says, and he said, to, he said to the crowd, oh, the audience after says, Mike, he says, have you been yelled at for 45 minutes? Uh, and, and Marcus, and, and, and he says, you woke me up, you give me, but for my job and, and that particular piece of content, it's all about the seven fundamentals of business and how to really scale up the hockey stick. Yep. And, and, and most of the people are just faking it. And the amount of people who came up to me after the event and said, Mike, you know, you've totally called me out. You've totally exposed me as a, as a, as a false, not intentionally. Um, he says, I'm just going to go back and I'm just going to sort, just sort my life out because I'm, you know, I'm faking it. I'm faking it till I'm making it. I'm doing this. Uh, and the amount of people, I got one heckler, uh, which is fine, one out of 50 or 45 or 50 in the audience for DM that day wasn't too bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, who, who didn't maybe like my style and thought it was a bit too aggressive. But, you know, if you're trying to scale your business and go high up the hockey stick, whether that's raise VC, exit, get us 10x multiple or whatever you want to do, putting an arm around you and giving you a cuddle and saying, yeah, you're doing okay, but just just, just wax this a little bit or wax that a little bit. No, you've got to break this down. You've got to go back and do the basics. And, you know, that's what I do. And my style is very direct. It's very in your face. And I suppose you either like that or you don't. If you like that and you want to wake up and you want to wake up a, a speaker slot to, and, and, and sort of, you know, give them the, the real life spine, heart, lungs, brain or everything of the business, then I'm your man. If you want something there to go and cuddle you and give you, a, you know, a little pep talk, don't hire me. I'm going to upset your audience and they're probably not going to be your customers. But that's exactly what you're saying there. And, you know, ultimately um, that permission to be yourself um, I don't. I don't ever think I didn't do that. Except I'd, I'd rather. I'd rather be criticised, I suppose, London for or heckled or trolled because we all get them. Um, I'd rather be that for being who I am than, than than that for trying to be the next whoever a lister is at this this moment in time. So, I, I've got two quick things. One thing is, in my sales career, when I got to that point where I just couldn't stand myself, right? The whole goal, the whole idea as the end all be all salesperson is to become a chameleon, to be able yeah. to sell to anybody, to be able to convey the ability to relate to anybody. And I was absolutely that. And ultimately underlying everything, that's what it was. I was being all these variations of myself that were kind of based on fact, but they weren't who I was. And when I finally gave myself permission to, here's who I am and you either like it or you don't. And some of you are going to love it. And some of you are going to hate it. And once I got that, I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> um, and the second thing here is there's a lot of people out there. Before we started this, you told me about some of the people that you've got lined up for, for doing yeah. podcasts. And yeah. like, here's the thing. There are people out there that are killing the marketing game. Yeah. And there are some pieces to that that are processes, systems, they're principles, and they work. Yeah. But if you are trying to do it like somebody else is doing it, yeah. you're never going to be as good as the person that you think is amazing because there's nobody as good as they are because they're being them. I always think as well, if they're trying to... You know, and if, if you're out there breaking through into this and you, you're wrestling with this, you know, you're chewing the gristle about whether I do it my way or try and half do it somebody else's way. Think about it this way. You know, what Landers just said there, nobody's going to be as good as them. That's what they do. And there's a great quote out there um, by Ray Kroc, you know, the founder of McDonald's. And he was asked in an interview in the early, I think early mid 80s, and maybe, maybe the date's slightly off here. And the interview question went something like this. Aren't you fed up with all the other burger chains, you know, copying, you know, your, your products? And Ray Kroc's answer, it sticks with me, you know, just like glue does, you know. And he came out and said this, hey, we can invent faster than they can copy. And when you look at that from an official, authentic point of view, we can invent faster than they can copy. Anybody trying to take Gary Vee on or some of these things, you know, they can, they're just streets ahead. You know, you, you, you couldn't work 600 hours a week and, and, and get as authentic as that, even if you'd have the knowledge or the connections or the associations that you had. So, you know, like you say, drop the act 
just be where you're going to be. Find what your your purpose in life is. Find out how you help people. Look at what Landon's done here. You know, he's he's he, he, he's awesome at what he does. He he got his height of his craft, but just didn't like the environment. So technically, to a degree, he's changed the environment and then flourished a little bit like I did in the in in 2000 when I loved what I did. I just didn't like who I was doing it with. And I changed the environment. Okay, you polish your processes, you learn along the way, and then you know you eventually you know, reach, well, whether you ever reach the end goal is another matter. You're always improving and going along the line and the di- market's dynamic and, and it changes. And uh, But that's an awesome way. And I really appreciate that, uh, Lana. Thanks for sharing that, buddy. Um, tell me, um, you, you talk about manufactured relatability in the old way and the natural relatability in the new way. And again, I know we're bouncing around in some of these things, but just talk to me what you mean about manufactured relatability to natural relatability, the old and the new way, and just drill down on that for us a little bit more if you would. Mm -hmm. So manufactured relatability is a learned skill set on how to read and then relate to somebody else. There's a term that's called social acuity. It is the ability to read a room and then assess how you're going to act in that environment. That's what salespeople do. We read people. Um, Empathy and the ability to actually listen to understand and the ability to dig and ask questions, naturally lead a conversation, all aid in this idea of finding a place of common ground. You've probably heard the term building rapport. Yeah, absolutely, yep. Okay, if, if I am a car and a food guy and you are a horse riding and hang gliding person, I might like those things, but I either like them enough to naturally relate with you or I don't really get riding horses and I've never been much for heights. So, but if I can find a point that I can kind of make you believe that I relate with you on, I can build rapport. It's manufactured relatability. Yep. Humans use the ability to relate to make judgment calls as to I like and trust this person or I don't. And that's what manufactured relatability allows you to do. The problem with that is to do it well takes kind of a long time to do it well enough to be effective for client acquisition. You're a business owner. You're not a salesperson. That's not a skill set you need to learn. Natural relatability is okay. I'm going to be real with myself. I'm going to be real with who I do and don't like. And I'm just going to further the connections with the people that I actually naturally relate to. And I'm going to stop trying hard. Yeah. <laughs> and right. the latter is the new way, the old yeah. way. On, on the manufactured stuff, I always find that, you know, you've got to be on your A games, you know, eight days a week to be that because you can't dip in and out of all those things. Like you mentioned earlier, you know, you, you, you like food, you like cars. What if, you know, chameleon, I've heard the word chameleon, chameleon selling and things like that before. And it, it's hard work, isn't it? Being, you know, constantly trying to be at that level to try and associate with somebody. Because sometimes people approach sales, it's not like just sat at the side of somebody on an airplane. Oh, where are you from? Denver, Colorado. Oh, yeah, I used to go to college at Denver, Colorado. Hey, we, you know, did you, you know, we, were you in this and that, whatever it was be? You know, that's a casual conversation. But it, when you when you exchange your money, like you say, you're obligated. You've got to be so much on your A game to be that and um when do you think that changed you know or, or do you think do you think people are still living in that world too much do you think people are recognizing it or do you think a big awareness campaign should be done to sort of educate people about um learning more about the natural relatability you know what, what do you think could be done about that well there's there's two pieces one for actual salespeople that like let's say you hired me to sell yachts <laughs> right okay well the people that buy yachts are naturally this kind of person I am not that kind of person. If you hired me to sell, you know, um, million dollar retreats in the mountains around the world, there's a certain kind of people that like that hunting, fishing, the outdoors. That's me. I could totally do that. Yeah. With that said, the vast majority of people that are trying to learn how to sell as a business owner don't need to go down the hard long road of learning the sales thing. And this is my whole point. I don't have anything wrong with the majority of the sales 
people and the sales training, the majority of it. There's some of it that's just flat out crap. Yeah. But we also know that there's a lot of really amazing sales training out there. The difference and the distinction is this. If you're learning how to manipulate somebody else's decision-making ability, you're doing it wrong. And if you're trying to learn how to sell because you're an entrepreneur and you sell a service or a product and you don't need 10 trillion clients, there's a way faster, easier way to get clients without all of the footwork. Yep. And it's by identifying the people you naturally relate with. Yeah, that's amazing. And, you know, when you look at it that way, all this podcast that we've done is client acquisition and the stories that we've done. But in the reality, you know, I get it. Why go out there and, you know, I'm not saying cut the granite cliff out with your own teeth and learn and do those hard yards. You know, there's a lot of people stood at the bottom of the cliff looking up and saying, hey, help me, isn't there? And it's just about relating to it. And I don't know if you remember a few minutes ago in the, in the podcast, Landon was talking about, you know, he's a crazy beard, crazy hair, you know, he likes fish, you know, he likes the outdoors, he likes cars, he likes food. You know, there's 7 billion people on the planet, you know, and I don't, I don't know what they, what's the updated number of small businesses in the, in the US uh, these days, London, what is it? 60 million or something ridiculous, 30, 60 million. I don't know what it is. I know there's 5 million in the UK, uh, about 5.2 million small businesses uh, in the UK. You know, surely as a business owner, you know, whether you are, you know, the crazy beard, the crazy hair or like me, you know, or whatever it would be, there's got to be a pool of people who you can relate to, who can connect with you and you know, surround yourself with those people and, you know, ultimately go seek them out and be yourself because is it, and I'm, I'm hoping you're going to agree here or you might call me out, Lando, that's absolutely fine as well. I get called out all the time saying, Mike, some of your, your, your views are ridiculous. I don't agree with you. And that's fine. It's only an opinion and it's only my state, but, you know, ultimately, I suppose the point that I'm, I'm trying to get to here is that, you know, if there is that, pot of people and you, you know, serve that people and all you got to do is sort of go and connect with them and be yourself, then there is enough business to go on for everybody, isn't it? And if you spend that quality time nailing that down, as opposed to trying to be somebody else or trying to serve other people for the wrong reason, then, you know, you'd have a better result. And that's where it comes back down to that quality over quantity, I suppose. Yes. And I've got a really cool um, analogy for that in a second, but there's a caveat to everything you just said. Yeah. It works if you've actually got a, a viable market, right? Of like course. if I'm selling something that nobody wants, it doesn't matter how well they relate to me or not. I've got to have something that somebody actually wants and more than a somebody. Here's the, here's the analogy that I use to help people understand this. Yeah. If you've got a viable market, let's say there's 100,000 people standing in a rainstorm. Yeah. You sell umbrellas, but you sell these massive, huge, giant, heavy umbrellas, and they are crazy colors. Now, out of that 100,000 people in, in the, that are standing outside in the rainstorm, there are people that are outside in, in bathing suits because they love being in the cold rain. They're not looking for an umbrella. Yeah right? They're looking for an occasional, maybe I might need an umbrella for that one day way down the road. They're not viable market. Correct. There's other people in that marketplace that are in yellow rain boots, but they don't have any other protection. So they're not there yet looking for an umbrella. There are other people. Okay. So we went from a hundred thousand people. We cut out 50,000 people yep. and then we cut out another 10,000 and pretty soon you get down to a marketplace of a thousand people that are seven feet tall that have the ability to pick up a 200 pound umbrella. <laughs> They've got all the other protection and they're looking for something that's brightly colored. Yeah. They're your people. Absolutely. It's a great analogy. It's a great analogy. And uh, the viable market thing is, do you see, you know, when people come to work with you, do you see that people um, are selling the wrong thing to the wrong people? Is that, is, you know, uh, obvious and they're just that blind? Because I know there's an old saying, isn't there? You know, stop selling what you want to sell and listen to your buyers about what they want to buy or what they need, you know, or what, how it solves the problem. But do you see a lot of that? And, and, and how, you know, if, if people are unsure about whether they've got, uh, you know, a product that's, you know, workable for the market or whatever, uh, what's the sort of guidance or advice you give around that? There's a lot of, there's a lot of people in that and, and very similar scenarios. And there's a couple of very basic things to understand. Either there's other people out there selling it and they're selling it su successfully. Yeah. And there's more than one or two, right? Or 
you've talked to enough people that are willing to actually give you money for you doing the thing. Yeah. If you've got a couple of those ingredients, it's pretty easy to, to understand. But I find a lot of people selling the wrong thing to the right people. A lot of people selling the right thing to the wrong people. A lot of people selling something that nobody wants. And generally, these are people that are beginners. And then there's another segment of that marketplace. They don't really care to do the thing that they're trying to sell. They're looking for the end result for them that somebody told them, here's a thing that you can sell to people. And it's really simple and easy to learn. The whole Facebook ad market for the last two and a half years, right? Everybody's a Facebook ads expert. The, most of those people don't, they're not interested in the thing. They don't care about what it does. They don't care about the clients. They want the, they want to make a million dollars next week because they yeah. bought a thousand dollar product this week. Yeah. Okay. There's people in all of those different spaces. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? And, and, you know, a lot of them are delusional as well to the fact that, you know, they, they just keep pressing and pressing and pressing with a product that either doesn't work. Like you said, the other trying to just make the money and, and not care about the end result, but that's going to be short lived. If you're out there doing that guys, you know, take a, take a step back and, you know, your longevity in business, scalability in business, if continue to provide value and, and serve the market, not just your own back pocket, I suppose. So uh, that's a great point. So as we start to wrap out on some of these questions, uh, Andon, um, you know, we've talked about that, you know, manufactured and natural relatability. And, you know, to me, whilst we know, you know, and I suppose like a lot of this stuff, this stuff ain't always dynamically cutting new what we do, what you do, what anybody else does. It, it's all relevancy to, to that point where you are in the marketplace. But it all came together me when, you know, the analogy that you use there about that manufactured and natural relatability. And, um, you know, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm doing the interview and I'm trying to think about some of the mistakes that we are still making in the business today. And not because we're trying to be Gary or anybody else like that, but, you know, I'm just thinking like, yeah, you has got, got a point there, London's got a point. So what I do, guys, is the listeners, you know, if you're watching this back on the blog or, or whatever it would be, you know, go and speak with your teams. Go and just say, and, and take a rain check, you know, a reality check. Give yourself a score out of 10. Whatever that is and say, you know, are we relative? Are we natural? Are we got a product that works? Um, you know, are we being real? You know, do we know what we do, who we do it for, how it helps them? And, you know, how do we market that? And, and, and just score yourself out of 10. I'd love to know what your scores are. If you just want to sort of shoot us a message, leave a comment, do whatever you would on that one. Um, you know, I'm sure London would like to, you know, sort of see what you're doing there as a you know, mini self-assessment. And I don't want to eat into anything that London does here. You know, there's so much more value that it does that you, you know that you can get involved with at the salesgorilla.com forward slash join if you want to sort of join the community that I'd highly recommend that you do that um, but it'd be good for you just to sort of take a rain check look at yourself in the mirror like London did you know going back way back when when he said enough is enough type of thing and just say am I actually in the right place do I have the right things in play am I concentrating on the right areas because if you're not then ultimately you're going to continue down a path that's either going to you know in the car world it's going to misfire you know you're running on six instead of eight now, or in the UK you're running on three instead of four because we only have grocery again as London not the, not the, not the real cars uh, in there so you know you don't want to be running on six and misfiring uh, but a lot of businesses are and you know it may not be the customer that's wrong it may not be whatever you just may have some timing out of the way and, and uh, I know you know, people reference I have a combination lock. They've got three locks dialed in, but maybe they just can't get that fourth or fifth lock dialed in and it's holding you back. So do an assessment. You should be doing that either monthly or quarterly strategically anyway, based on the size of your business. Uh, but in this case, what Lana is saying is it's absolutely relevant. So see how you go with that. And that's their great points. I really appreciate those, uh, London, you know, awesome. And a bit of a kick up the backside for me as well to make sure I need to get my house in order. So I've certainly learned something today. So as we sort of wrap out on some of these questions, talk to me about reversing the roles in sales conversion and the benefits that this delivers. Sure. So when you get clear on who it is that you want to work with and you just, I, I call it just basically being naked to your market, right? This is who I am. This is how I operate. This is who I want. If you just do that, what it causes is the, neediness to make the sale naturally goes away. And there's another ingredient to it. If you're good at the thing that you do and you actually enjoy doing it, it's not the prospect that gets to say yes or no. It's you getting to choose who gets to have it. And I want everybody to think back to, and I know we call it something slightly different, 
uh, in the different continents, but in high school, right? When you were in high school, there were people that were just like easygoing and everybody wanted to date them. And then there were other people that were like highly desperate to get a date. <laughs> and I relate sales to dating a lot because the natural psychology and what's going on is so the same. It's not even funny. Amazing. Yeah, and here's right. Right. And, and I call it positive indifference. And again, I didn't coin the term positive indifference is the ability to not have an attachment to a specific outcome. Yes or no mean the exact same thing to me. Yeah. And if you're in my world looking at what it is that we do and you've gone through the filtering process, the pre-qualification process enough to go, I want the thing. How do I get it? Whether we do it over messenger, over email, over a zoom call or whatever, or you just buy something on a sales page, that positive indifference allows me to say, no, this is not for you and you can't have it. Yep. It changes the dynamic when you're on a sales call because it's not you hoping and wishing they will buy it and trying somehow to get them to do that. It is, this is what I do. This is how I do it. You're totally a fit. You can have the thing, but you're going to have to have a spine and reach out and take it if you want it. Interesting. Positive indifference. It's an amazing analogy. It's not the prospect's place to say yes or no. You, as the salesperson, only have the right to tell the person who's a yes, 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 yes. You have the responsibility to tell them yes or no. And that drastically changes the sales process. Tell, tell me, I've got, I've got to ask this. When you were talking there, my mind's racing. And, uh, Dan Tyra Hubs, what he calls it the lizard brain, who starts going berserk and, and, and things like that. Um, people are going to be sat here thinking like, whoa, you know, how does that work in sales? You know, it's my responsibility to can have it or not. How do I move from that? And I know all the value, the amazing uh, points. I mean, literally, Landon, I am full. My notes are full. Uh, I've run out of space, so I think I need to get a bigger book next time we do this. I do that. But, you know, a lot of people will be saying, hey, I can, I can move so far uh, and things like that. How do I actually move into being confident enough to, to, to do that? Because mm -hmm. I'm under quota, I'm under pressure for target or um, if they want it and is it not their responsibility to make sure they get the best out of it and it's, you know, I've done my job with the disclaimer. How do they move from that mindset? Because out of everything we've talked about today, that's surely got to be a big concern for people or a mindset. I, when people come to you, how do you deal with that? And how do you get them over that hump? Yes, and to, to start that, to preface that, think of it like this. When you were leasing cars, would yeah. you have leased an M5 to a 17-year-old kid who has a no. new wife and a baby, <laughs> and he's not got the money, but he's going to figure out how to do it because he wants to do 180 or 200 on the Autobahn? You're going to tell him, no, you I cannot have them. So you gotta I don't respond. care how bad you want it. It's not for you, yeah. right? That's the preface of it. And here's, you, you mentioned at the top of the show, I don't believe in sales scripts. Yeah. Scripts don't work. Yeah. What does work is there is a natural flow to a conversation. And I'll just, for the people that made it this far, I'll just give it to them. Yeah. There's four pieces to it. Yeah. Intro, setting the agenda, qualifying, and making an offer. Yeah. And how you get the confidence to do that starts with knowing who you want to work with, the relationship marketing and the social selling filters out all the wrong people. So by the time the people are there that want it and are a fit, the sales conversation's easy. I'm now deciding if you've got what it takes to work with me. Yeah. It's a yes or no discussion. Brilliant. Just recap those four again, starting with the intro. Um, so the four again are? Intro? Yep. Hi, Mike, how you doing? Blah, 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 blah. Nicety, nicety. Yep. Setting the agenda. They say, cool, so how's this work? Or something along those lines. Tell me about your thing. How much does it cost, et cetera. Let's do it like this. Yeah. I'm going to ask you a few questions. You're going to get to tell me all the questions you've got. I'm going to tell you all about my thing. And then if it makes sense, I'll ask you one simple question. Do you want and, to they, there's, and then you say, is that fair? And they say, yeah, that's totally fair. Well, they just agreed to let you qualify them. Yep. Now I'm going to ask them questions. That's qualifying. 
And the fourth piece is if they're qualified and I want to work with them, here's how you get it. Yeah. And, and don't be shy about that because if you can genuinely help somebody, right. you're not, you know, th that's that exchange of value, isn't it, London? Whereas you've got a problem or a requirement, I can legitimately help you th with that. Uh, and, you know, it's just down, down to the value exchange of money and time or service or product or whatever, you, you know, you guys do. Yep. But that's a great way of doing it. And uh, sometimes, you know, we get busy in the hustle and bustle of the day and sometimes you just lose the basics. And, you know, look what Lando's has done there. He's just taking it down. And that's why I asked him to repeat it. Just put it into simple steps. Mm -hmm. And, you know, have a conscience, I think, is, is another maybe way I could wrap around that. But love the analogy about the M5 and the 17-year-old kid uh, with, the, with the young child. Yeah, I don't want that, to, that, that M5 wrapping around a lamppost and a family, you know, being bereaved. And, and, you know, ultimately, the insurer would have an issue with that. We would have an issue with that. And you don't want to be in that situation where if you did sell that vehicle or lease that vehicle, in, in my example, from my background in wheeled asset, uh, and then the insurer couldn't insure him, you know, and you can't send it back. He's stuck with a, you know, whatever, what are M5s these days? 80 grand, so it's about a $100,000 car, <laughs> you know, that he can't drive because he can't insure it. So yeah, it's out about, more than conscious, it's responsibility, you know, it's responsible qualification. Does this actual thing work? We've all, I don't care who you are, what you are, at what level, we've all been ripped off whether it's a fake product that somebody's trying to pass on to us, whether it's a ticket or a watch or whatever, when you were younger, you know, you've had a bad, you know, bum advert that comes out and, you know, you believe it to be one thing and then when it turns up, it looks like something else. Um, you know, there's always that thing. And how do we feel about that? It's that emotion of disappointment or anger and things like that. And, you know, if you're that type of person who just says, well, hey, I've got the money, then, you know, like I say, you certainly ain't for us. And <laughs> I'm sure it's certainly not for London as well. So, you know, that's, that's where you've got to take a long, good, hard look at yourself. But that's awesome. I really, really appreciate you wrapping up on that, uh, London. And, uh, um, I think the value that you provided is, is, is absolutely immense. Um, you know, I need to go back and work in my business as well and, uh, and apply some of these things for sure. So I'm looking forward to our follow-up call in the next few weeks as well. I'd love to sort of digest this and give it. So it's an immense piece of value. Um, thanks. It, it, unbelievable value. And I think that, you know, ultimately client acquisition, I opened the show by saying, hey, if we don't have a client acquisition problem, you're going to put pretty much be out of business. I think we've all learned something today to sort of dilute those steps, break down some, some great experiences. And the great thing, what I love about doing the open mic as well is that the real stories, these ain't manufactured stuff. The stories I share with you, they're auditable, they're actionable. You know, things like Landon shared with you there, you know, being in that place where you're physically looking at, not, I mean, it's bad enough throwing the office chair out of the window anyway, but thinking about following it down. By the way, how many, how many floors was that London? <laughs> was that a short floor or was it fairly high up? No, it was three stories up. It was, it was just enough to get the yeah. job done. <laughs> well, well, thank God uh, that that didn't happen. And, uh, you know, the, either the window didn't break or something stopped you share, throwing the chair. But uh, I'm, I'm so pleased that that didn't happen. And I'm so pleased we've met on this journey today because I think we've got so much in common. Um, different sides of the Atlantic, different parts of the world. Um, but, you know, hope you've, as the audience, as you're listening, you've had an absolute bucket load of value. I certainly have today. And uh, we've covered so much, London, in, in, across not only the stories, the, the, the backdrops, the examples, the, the detailed analysis of the questions. If we were to sort of, you know, I feel I'm rather embarrassed asking this because of the value you've done and I don't want to shortcut it or cheat me. But if I could say, could you condense that into three, three sort of short things that somebody wants to get started with this, what are the top three things you'd, you, you, you'd, you'd share with the listeners so they could get going? Uh, apart from, you know, sort of looking themselves in the mirror, like that, but share three things with us that you would say, if you want to do this on your own, you want to come into my program, it doesn't really matter. What are the three things that you would condense it down to, so which are absolute essentials? The three things that I would say is get honest with yourself and get clear on who you want to work with based on what you will and will not tolerate. Right? That's number one. Number two is give yourself permission to be yourself and show up in front of your market. Yeah. It doesn't have to be 10 million pieces of content a day, Gary V style. I love Gary V. I'm a fanboy. I ain't doing that, right? It doesn't need to be that way. You just need to show up in front of your audience. And then the third thing is, look, you're not trying to get somebody to do something. The responsibility of the salesperson is to identify people that are actually the right fit 
and actually need and want what you sell. And then it's your job to allow them to have it or tell them no. That's the third thing. Those, that's it. If you can do those three things and you've got a viable market, you'll get clients. That's amazing. And I love the thing that, you know, you, you know, I didn't, the salesman's job is to identify the fit, you know, the need and, you know, and are they allowed to have it or not? Wow. Yeah. So, so powerful stuff. That is absolutely amazing. Lan. Thanks ever so much. You put it in such a, dare I say, eloquent and simple format. And I hope that, you know, the listeners today, um, whether you're re-listening this back, you know, you're reading it in the show notes or whatever, you do take some of this stuff on board because, you know, everything in the world has probably been done, you know, you know, until the next, next iPhone equivalent or whatever is going to change the market. Everything in the market's been done. And sometimes um, it's just about understanding it, you know, dumbing it down, bringing it in and then just taking action. And um, I think some of the strategies we've got out on this uh, podcast should surely help you along your way. Um, so thanks for listening on that. And, and Landon, it's been an absolute pleasure. And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of humbled and honored that you've chosen to sort of take, you know, the thick end of 90 minutes out of your day uh, and share this value. It's, it's been an absolute education and it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Well, again, I found somebody that's a fit for me. You and I totally fit on so many different levels. I look forward to getting to know you beyond this show, but I got to say this. I've been on a lot of podcasts. Like I've, I've not been on hundreds, but I've been on a lot of podcasts. You guys are world-class and this has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you for having me. No, listen, uh, it's absolutely, you know, I'm, I'm humbled that, and thank you for your kind comments. Uh, the team behind it, I'm just the guy who sits in the chair, you know, whatever, but Jamie, Ellie, the team here, you know, the production people, the video editors, you know, they're the guys who should take the credit. You know, I just, I'm just the guy who sits in the chair or sort of thing and, and shows up and does my thing if, if that's the right thing. But seriously, I'm, I'm seriously looking forward to connecting. And uh, we're in and out of the States two or three times a year anyway, so we've got to make sure that we get over to, to, to uh, meet up as well. So last as a close out on the show, thanks again, Landon. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, you want to learn more about what Landon does, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you jump on there. Head over and connect with London on LinkedIn, linkedin.com forward slash IN forward slash London hyphen Porter uh, over on Facebook. Um, and you can check out the group Gorilla Juice and obviously the salesgorilla.com. Um, if you want to sort of get started with London and sort of look at some of the courses and, and the materials that he does, and if you're ready to get going, uh, head over to the salesgorilla.com forward slash join and take a look at the materials on there. There's not just courses, there's a whole host of resources and, and, and valuable content on there. And of course, you can connect with him on um on social media. Uh, so before I, I, I uh, sort of close out, Lana, thanks again. It's been an absolute pleasure uh, having you on the show. Likewise, Mike. You have a fantastic day. That's great. And for the audience, we really appreciate you sticking around and I'm sure you've had so much value. Uh, we really appreciate you tuning in, giving up your valuable time, continuing your growth engine development. And as always, to get in the game, go to the hustle, go make it happen, and we'll catch up with you on an open mic podcast real soon. been listening to the open mic brought to you by the success hub to find out more and to get the resources we have mentioned in this podcast episode simply visit blog.thesuccesshub.io and view the podcast section thanks for listening and we look forward to catching up with you in our next episode This podcast and associated materials is published under copyright to the Success Hub. All rights reserved. No reproduction of this material is permitted.